uh, I enjoyed your call to actions for innovations and networking and all these other parts of the Bitcoin protocol. My question is, is there room for non-technical contributions to the open source project? Uh, for instance, you know, how would one go about redesigning the core Bitcoin QT app? Um, will there ever be a core Bitcoin designer on the team or will it only be core developers? And kind of like, this is a personal addendum question. How did the first Bitcoin logo come about? I think Satoshi actually created the first Bitcoin logo, if I recall correctly. Just posted it on the forums. Um, and then people decided they didn't like it and they reworked it and came up with other logos. And uh, I mean, I haven't, I haven't seen <coughs> open source software projects ever be good at design. <laughs> I don't know, maybe there's, a, maybe there's an exception that I don't know about, but it's just, you know, I mean, Apple is great at design. They're kind of the antithesis of open source. Um, so uh, design in particular, yeah, I, I think you'd be better off, you know, I think we are better off, you know, relying on kind of third party wallets that are you know, venture funded and are trying to get consumers um, the reference implementation, we call it the reference implementation because we really intend for it to be kind of, you know, this is how you do things, but not necessarily how you make them look pretty. Um, so, I mean, you could talk to Vladimir. Vladimir did the, uh, the CoinQT GUI, uh, if you want to contribute. And actually, you know, one, one interesting career path, I think, these days is to make some you know, valuable contributions to the Bitcoin core code. And if companies see you making valuable contributions to the core code, it, they're always looking for good programmers, good designers, you know, <coughs> good talent. And so that's, that's, that's an easy way to improve your worth. And you are likely to get a job at you know, one of these many Bitcoin companies that are starting up and doing really cool things. Uh, yeah, so you mentioned that you're looking into uh, more research into the network side of the Bitcoin network topics. Like, that's really great to see. My question is, like, how high up is the scalability of the reference implementation itself? For example, like, it, it works great for individual users, but if you're a startup or you're building some stuff on Bitcoin, you need to do, like, thousands of transactions or you're running, like, hundreds of uh, Bitcoin demons, uh, you would end up writing custom code. And then you're, you're, you're forced with the, the reference implementation and you end up, you know, doing your own. You're poking me right in a sore spot. Right. <laughs> so, um, actually, Gregory, Greg and I were just talking about this at breakfast. That the, the the wallet code in the reference implementation needs to be rewritten, and we really, ideally, you know, there would be a, a red hat for Bitcoin. I've been saying this for a while now. I thought that was the foundation. The foundation is not red hat for Bitcoin. I mean, we need a, a commercial company that is invested in, you know, just like Red Hat Linux took the open source software project, packaged it up nicely, provided training, provided, you know, kind of all the things that a company would need to, if they want to use Red Hat for whatever, you know, operating system in my cell phone or, or all the different things that Linux are used for. So we really need that for Bitcoin. Um, and ideally, that company would have a team that you know is the the uh, production quality industrial wallet team that has the wallet software that was carefully designed to interact with you know all these enterprise level accounting systems and stuff that I know nothing about. Right? That is a a, a crying need. Um, I'm hoping somebody someday will just have a startup that does that. Uh, but right now we're at this uncomfortable place where the reference implementation wallet code is, is kind of good enough. Like InstaWallet was using it and patched it and had hundreds of thousands of users and then InstaWallet either collapsed or got decided to run with the money or whatever. And you know, maybe partly because you know they didn't have a really solid base to build on. So again, you know, you're poking us a sore spot where I don't have a good answer. Um, hi. Um, I know you said that you didn't want to change the proof of work, but I keep flashing back to that 100 megawatt 
number from before, which may or may not be an accurate estimate. But it seems to me that's a huge amount for society to spend for just a database insert. Um, and I, I, when I look at it, I start to get the feeling like it's one of the, it's like maybe perhaps healthcare costs. <coughs> and it'll consume more and more of society's energy usage if, if it's on its current track. And I wonder if you think about that or you think, or you have another argument against it that it will all equilibrate out or you don't even notice it at all. I mean, it, it should. The, the, the amount of effort put into proof of work is proportional to kind of the value of the bitcoins that the miners are getting. And that should kind of level out, right? So as the, the block reward goes down, it'll all be transaction fees. You know, transaction fees are related to how many transactions are happening. Uh, so the only way miners will make money is by getting transaction fees from transactions that are happening. The, the, the idea is that transactions are valuable, right? I mean, that's, that's why you'd be willing to pay a fee is because they're valuable. Miners you know, won't spend more processing those transactions to get the fees than, the, than it costs them. That'll be marginally a little bit more. So you know, whatever cost is expressed in the mining, you can think of it as that is the value that people are getting from transacting using Bitcoin. So in the long run, you know, I'm confident that the economics work out. And I, I'm, not, I'm not an economist either, uh, but you know, I, I think that that rationale is correct. I think you know, right now, we have this crazy ramp up period uh, where there's all sorts of changes in mining and, and we're in this race to smaller and smaller and more power efficient mining hardware, and also in this huge ramp up in you know people using Bitcoin, which is causing the the, the price to go up, and all of that is is contributing to an over uh, over mining. Really, where where we have too much mining at the moment, we are, we're over uh, the network is overly secure. But in the long run, I think it will work itself out. I'm just wondering, uh, do you think bits of proof could be Red Hat for Bitcoin? And are there any other alternative implementation projects that you think are particularly promising or exciting? Um, bits of proof seems to have stalled. And I think maybe the, the lead developer just wasn't good enough at kind of building community um, and or you know, the business side of things to you know, scale up his business. Um, the, the PTCD from the conformal system guys, which is a re-implementation in Go, uh, that's interesting. You know, I, I can't, I can't vouch for any other implementation. And, and the real hurdle is that if you get it wrong, you know, if, if you're a miner and you decide to use something other than the reference implementation and you get it wrong, you know, you solve a block, you think you have 25 Bitcoins, and then it gets rejected by the network. That's a good chunk of money. So it's actually a pretty big risk to go with anything besides reference implementation. Uh, and again, that's a hard problem. Uh, we're, we make incremental progress to kind of smooth off rough edges that we find. And the process of people re-implementing Bitcoin in other languages and kind of stubbing their toe or falling on their face helps us find those rough edges, um, that's another really hard problem. Uh, so a pretty contentious issue these past couple of weeks has been embedding uh, extra data into the blockchain. Uh, and you guys have come up with op return, you know, provably printable script that allows you to embed. It was originally 80, it's come down to 40. Uh, I know, you know there's been a lot of contention about that. Where do you see the conversation going and how can we kind of well, a lot of the concerns that various communities have, be it the master point counterparties, and wh where are you with that conversation? I think it should be 42. Um, no, um, <laughs> I haven't seen a good argument for why you need more than 40 bytes. I mean, I, I've actually been very tempted to, to carve out time and write a post that says, so you want to use op return. Here's kind of how we think you ought to be thinking about it. 
And I think people tend to kind of bundle together a bunch of different things that, that Bitcoin gives you. So I mean, the blockchain gives you this nice ledger where you know, transactions have a very particular order with a lot of uh, consensus behind it. Uh, it also has this, this currency, which can be very useful if you want to worry about things like denial of service attacks, which I'm sure you know something like MasterCoin will worry about somebody flooding their network with gazillions of MasterCoin contracts just because they can, and if they can, they will. Um, but like those two pieces of functionality don't necessarily need to be, well, and then, and then there's kind of the data storage, which on return gets at a little bit, um, which a lot of people kind of get excited about, you know, this huge ledger all over the world that's nice and distributed, and I don't need to worry about somebody knocking over their hard drive and, you know, my whole database of all the transaction goes away. That just doesn't happen with Bitcoin because it's everybody's hard drives everywhere. But if you, if you kind of separate out those pieces of functionality, I think you can design very interesting systems where, you know, you use the blockchain ledger to kind of put a pointer, a hash, to some data that's stored reliably, not in the Bitcoin blockchain, but somewhere else. And it's kind of a building block that I think you can do all sorts of really interesting things on. And, and quite frankly, I think some of these other systems are just being lazy. They're not, they're, 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 they're building things the way they are because it's convenient, not because it's kind of conceptually the right way to do it. And, you know, if I could go back and design Bitcoin from scratch, you know, maybe all the Bitcoin transactions wouldn't actually be in the blockchain. Maybe it'd be nothing but hashes and there'd be some other distributed data structure that would store them. I don't know. That's neither here nor there because you can't do that. But, you know, if you are designing a new system, you, you, you do have more. Yeah, so I just wanted to say thanks for the work you're doing. That's the first point. Uh, here, here. Yeah. Thanks. The community is also important. I know it instills a culture about the whole project, and it's just important to reflect that and recognize that. Um, specific question, just last ask about Hot uh, Multisig. That's awesome and great. I'm glad that's there. Are you planning to leave it two of three? Make it truly MMN? How much can you jam in that little piece, or daisy chain it? Or well, there's some really interesting research going on here at Princeton for threshold uh, ECDSA signatures, which I'm really interested in and excited about. So we may not need to ever go more than three because there may be better ways of, of doing it. I see it. I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, you've been very generous with your time, and we've gone a little bit over. Um, but we'll take that up the break. Anyway, uh, we'd like to thank you, Gavin, very much for this rare opportunity. Uh, thank you. OK, we're going to go straight into